Good evening. Welcome to our program. I'm Stan Adams. I'm with the Word and Sword TV broadcast coming to you live from Hickory, North Carolina, WHKY Studios. And this program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. And at the outset, we want you to know that as the program goes on and as we've done throughout the time on the air that we've been here, do not to send us any money. Uh, the Newton Church of Christ funds this program entirely and we just want you to study the Bible with us. And we thank you for your time tonight. You could be many places tonight looking at different things. But if you're with us right now, you have chosen to study God's Word with us tonight. So many of you have been faithful to do that over the years, and that's not gone, gone unnoticed by us. And we thank you for your time. It's very, very important. We want to welcome Bob Pulliam to this area. Bob Pulliam is with us tonight. And Bob is uh, preaching for the Tryon Street Church of Christ, I believe, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And Bob, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been preaching nearly 40 years. Um, started out uh, my first work with my wife, the two of us by ourselves, no one else. Uh, we were in Leesville, Louisiana, and we spent eight and a half years there and uh, went on to Texas and then after working with the church there came up to West Virginia uh, preached up in West Virginia for a while then moved back down to Texas and now we didn't quite get all the way to West Virginia uh, we're in North Carolina now so and we're happy to be here we're finding uh, so many friendly people brotherly kindness a love for truth and we're just so happy to be here well, I think you'll enjoy the area because it's, it's an area where people want to discuss the Bible and are open to discuss the Bible. And it's, it's been one of the things that I've noted in the time that I've been up in this area is that people are hungry for the Gospel. And they, they read their Bibles. And uh, we may come up with different ideas on it, but we can talk about it. And that's not true everywhere. Uh, and it's important that we're able to, to discuss things. And um, we, can, we can even disagree with the right spirit. And uh, that's something that's been notable. And yeah, um, That's very important. I think it is. And it's, it's not found everywhere in the country, and it is here. And we, we thank all of you for being with us tonight. This program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. And we're going to go to, our chart, to the chart now to where you can take notes, if you want to, about uh, who we are and what you need to do. Operators are standing by. This is a live TV broadcast. And you can call in with a, your question, your biblical question, book, chapter, and verse answer will be given to you. And if we don't know the answer, we'll tell you we don't know it, and we'll find it, and we'll get back with you on that. You can ask for a copy of this presentation tonight or for previous pre presentations on different subjects. You can ask for a free Bible correspondence course. We currently offer two on the site, and one of them is inter, uh, interactive with uh, the computer, and one of them is just a mailed uh, correspondence course. And if you would like either one of those, they're all free of charge. You can also call in and ask for a free tract. A tract is nothing but a printed sermon. You can ask for a map to the building or you can just Google and uh, get to the building if you want to. You can ask to be added to the monthly, uh, or the monthly uh, bulletin, the Beacon, and uh, it is mailed out quarterly, but it is a monthly publication, the Beacon, and so if you would like to be on that list, call in and leave your address with our operators. We do not spam you, by the way, if you leave your address. We don't uh, bother you or, or uh, in any way annoy you. Uh, you can arrange a personal Bible study with us. We, we love those. If you would like to meet publicly somewhere, uh, we understand that. We certainly would be very, very welcoming to that. And also, if you want us to come into your home, we will come into your home and study the Bible with you. And we'll come with someone else. We won't uh, come into the situation and make you nervous in any way. And uh, everything's open and above board. And it is a different world that we live in. And so we need to also, all of us, make sure that we provide things honest in the sight of all men. Also, you can call and uh, get a free biblical study aid uh, tonight uh, by any number of uh, means tonight. We offer those all the time. And also, you can go to www.wordandsword.com. That is the website for the Newton Church of Christ. And there's a, there's a mountain of information on there if you would like to go there and access for your own Bible study. And uh, some of you have called in and you uh, have been involved in wanting to know if you can use some of our material for your Bible classes. 
feel free to do that. Uh, just don't change it, if you would, and uh, just as, it's, as it is on the show. You can call tonight with a biblical uh, book chapter or a biblical question and get a book chapter and verse answer. The number is 828-485-5555. That will be scrolling throughout the program in the bottom right hand corner of the, of the screen. You can also go to Facebook and you can like us there at facebook.com slash word and sword. And you can leave a message up there or a question. You can also post a question at facebook.com, Newton, North Carolina, Church of Christ. And then follow us on Twitter at Word and Sword. And again, all these mediums are available for you to, to have any Bible question that you have dealt with from the Scripture. The name of the program is The Word and the Sword. And we want to give you book, chapter, and verse for the things that we do. Because at the end of it all, it will be the Word of God that will judge us on that last day. We'll be judged by how we are obedient to the commands of the Lord. So tonight again, 828-485-5555. The Newton Church of Christ assembles at 9.30 on Sunday morning and 11 o'clock. Uh, they have 9.30 Bible, Bible classes and then 11 o'clock worship. Wednesday night Bible study is at 7 p.m. And they meet at 656 St. James Church Road in Newton, North Carolina. And they would welcome you into the assembly and you would be a most welcome guest. They won't put you on the spot at all. They just are, they certainly will make you, make you welcome. And uh, go visit with the Newton Church of Christ at these times. The Word and Sword also, again, is brought to you by, entirely by the Newton Church of Christ. Again, please do not send us your money. Uh, you can contact the Newton Church of Christ by email by simply going to contact at wordandsword.com by phone at 828-465-3009, or by mail at P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina, 28658. Again, the website is www.wordandsword.com. It's the most important question in the world, Bob. What must I do to be saved? And there are so many different answers that are out there on that. A lot of people will tell you, any number of things. What are some of them you've heard? Oh, it's amazing. You have people that uh, are getting it directly. They're getting it as indirectly as you could possibly imagine. Uh, my wife picked up a tract. Uh, I believe it was just yesterday. In fact, it was. She was handed, handed the tract uh, by someone. Uh, she took it and she saw it and she knew immediately from the front and it was five things you must do to be saved. And so I thought, well, this is gonna, this is gonna be interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I opened it up and I began to read it. And uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't much of it that accorded with what we find in the New Testament, unfortunately. Uh, but they found five things. I don't know if they were trying to go along with the five points of Calvinism or not, uh, but uh, they, um, uh, they just couldn't get it. Uh, some of the times you need a, a direct operation of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that when it comes to that, you'll find that uh, some believe that you have to have spoken in tongues or you weren't saved. Ooh. And then there are some that they don't believe you have to have spoken in tongues, but you do need some kind of experience. Second worship of grace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as you know, oftentimes what this gets down to is they're going to have to come and they're going to have to tell the congregation. Some of the times it's even voted on by the church as to whether the church thinks that the Holy Spirit really did move upon them. And so you have a body of men and women who are actually deciding whether someone's saved or not based on what they've testified. It, it can get very, very strange. And some of the times it can seem like it goes along with the Bible. And it just, it, it's so important that we prove all things by the Word of God. Exactly. Bible says in John 12, verse 48, Jesus said, because there's a lot of people up this way, Bob, that believe that whatever Jesus says, they will do. But if it can't be found by what Jesus says, then they're not ready to do it. The red letter edition. And so in John 12, 48, what we've sought to do is to try on this chart that we have, is to try to show that what Jesus has said about salvation in John 12, 48, he that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. 
So we have to receive the words that the Lord has given. That's much of what Paul said in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So we have to hear the Word of God. That moves us to a faith. And in John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus said, except you believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins. In Romans 10, 10, we must confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we must believe, Hebrews 11, 6, we must have faith. Without faith we can't please Him. So those are all things that are necessary. And most people would agree that we have to hear what God said, and we have to believe it. Now we don't have to believe it, I guess. You could say. Just depends on what you want. <laughs> right, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and um, so th if you hear it and you believe it, then they're good with that. And then we get down to repentance. And Jesus says in Luke 13 and verse 3, that repentance is absolutely essential for our salvation and that we must turn from our evil ways. Most people would agree with that, that you have to change your life somehow. And then confession. Most people would agree with that. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 32, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. And we know that Acts 8, verse 27 through 39, that the eunuch said, I, am, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we know that Romans 10, 10, with the heart man believes, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And we would have virtual agreement on all of those up this way. But the next one is the one we have a problem with. And I don't know why it is such an issue, but it is. Mm -hmm. um, you can go ahead and take that one. What is it? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you mentioned a moment ago repenting. And, and if we can agree on that, why is this such a problem? When we turn to Acts 2.38, and, and the, the Jews on Pentecost, they're in Acts chapter 2. Peter's preached to them. He's convicted them of their sin. In verse 37, they're cut to the heart. These aren't happy people because they're saved. They're cut to the heart. And then we have Peter telling them what they must do because they ask. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the thing that becomes interesting to me here is that Peter tells them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Now, what troubles me is people will say, yes, you have to repent, but you don't have to be baptized. And yet that's exactly what Peter told these people right here to do. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Which incidentally happens to be the same way that Jesus put it in, in Matthew chapter 26 when uh, he was instituting the Lord's Supper, find in verse 28 that he pointed out that his blood is shed for many for the remission of sins. It's exactly the same wording in the Greek. Mm -hmm. And somebody wants to come along and they want to say, well, that's not really for in order to get the remission of sins. For there means because, because you have the remission of sins. Well, now, if they have the remission of sins, then they got it before they repented. They also got it before they knew that they had it because they were cut to the heart in the verse before. The problem here is that these people needed to be saved. Peter is telling them what to do to be saved. And not only were they to repent, but they were to be baptized. And so when we go through the book of Acts, we find over and over again this same formula coming up. In fact, the one common denominator, when we look at all of these texts, the one common denominator in them is be baptized. Mm -hmm. Believing isn't even in every text that talks about being saved, but you know, we understand it's there. We right. know that they believed. But baptism is mentioned. Why would we want to read that out of Scripture when the apostles and the Holy Spirit put it into Scripture? So we must be baptized. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. We find in verses 3 through 4 that this is a burial. And we, we learn that these people were baptized into Christ. Now, I want to be in Christ. And in all the Bible studies that I've held in the last 40 years, I've never gone into one and asked people, do you want to go be in Christ? 
Every one of them knew that's something that you need. That's something that you have to, to be. And they understand, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. We have to initiate that relationship. And we have to do it God's way. And so what we do here is we get into Christ the way that God says to do it. And Paul said that the Romans did it by being baptized into Christ. Same is true in, in Galatians chapter 3 in verse 27. These people got into Christ by being baptized into him. When 1 Peter 3, verse 21, you know, some of the times people say that, well, you know, the Bible never associates baptism and salvation. And yet when we look at 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse 21, we find here that the people in Noah's day, in verse 20, they were saved by water. And then in verse 21, Peter makes the point, the like figure wherein to baptism doth also now save us. Well, if baptism in some way saves us, we don't need to explain that away. We need to understand how. And it's not that we've, we've done something spectacular, that we've made up something truly wonderful. It's simply that we've believed and we've obeyed what God wants us to do. Okay. Very good. Very good. Now, we get to the sixth step now. Yeah. Because it's not once saved, always saved. It is keeping the commandments of the Lord. And all of what we're talking about right now, by the way, will fold right into what we're going to be talking about this evening on how did we get the Bible and is the Bible the inspired Word of God. The words that we are reading to you are from God's Word. These are words of life, and every one of them is true. Not a one of them is not is false. Yeah, being faithful unto death is what we must do in order to be saved. We can forfeit our salvation. A Christian can lose their salvation. Now, a lot of people don't want to believe that. They like the idea of the eternal security of the saints, and that once you're saved, once you're in grace, you're never going to get out of grace. But we see in Acts 2 and verse 47 that the Lord added them to His church and they were to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread and prayer, verse 42 and following. And then in Revelation 2 and verse 10 we see that what they did, that they were told there in the first part of verse 10 to be faithful unto death and they would receive the crown of life. We also know that Matthew 24 talks about the idea of enduring the idea of staying with the, the race that you're in, and even in the face of great tribulation and trials, to hold on. 2 Peter 2, verse 22 is another passage, probably one of the most distasteful passages in the Bible. It's, it's my favorite <laughs> passage on that subject. <laughs> right, right. What does it say? Well, it tells us that those people, they had actually been enlightened with the word of truth, but then they had returned to the world. These are people who were saved, and there's just no way around Peter's wording here to, to say that they were never saved to begin with, but instead these are people who had returned to the world and, and they were lost. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand that a person can be saved and then be lost, whether yeah. we like it or not. Exactly. And it's really not what we like or don't like. It's what did God say? And in 2 Peter 2.22, he says there that it's like, it's, it's just like a dog returning to his vomit and a sow that has been washed to wallowing in the mire. Again, we don't have the right to go back into the world without consequence. And we, we can do whatever we want to. God's not going to stop us from doing it. But if we pursue a certain course, there's consequences to that. There's consequences to faithfulness, and there are consequences to unfaithfulness, and we need to keep that in mind. So if you're watching tonight, and you once were faithful to the Lord, and you're not now, well, you need to get that straight, and you need to repent of your sins, as uh, Simon the sorcerer did in Acts 8, and pray God that the thought and intent of your heart be forgiven you. And we would urge you, and we, we are here and all about trying to help people get in right relationship with the Lord. So if you've never been baptized for mission of your sins, if you've never been uh, the type of person that has 
gone ahead and done the changes that are necessary, then we would urge you to call us tonight and to let us help you in whatever way we can to come to Christ. Well, we also want you to know that tonight's program will be on the Holy Bible. Now, the chart we have here, and if you're uh, watching the program tonight, you know that, and if you've been watching very long, you know that we go by the Bible. If you have a Bible somewhere on it, it says Holy Bible. Now that says that it's a different book. Biblios actually just means book. That's all it means. And a holy book is one that is to be revered and honored and respected. It is separate. It is set aside. And it is a book that is the book that we are going to be judged by. So as we're going to be talking about the Bible tonight, we want you to look, if you will, if you ever wondered why in the world and where do we get Bible authority to call our Bibles Bibles. If we do all the things we do with Bible authority, is there any authority for calling the Bible the Bible? Turn to Hebrews 10 and verse 7. Okay. And the Hebrew writer here, believe, I believe it was Paul, says this. He says, then, it's, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. So something was written in the book that is referred to here, to do the will of God. You find doing the will of God in the book, in the Biblios. And that word is certainly not a, not a word that you and I would use, Biblios, today. But it is, we get our, some of our library terms, bibliographies, things such as that, from this idea. How many books did you reference, that type of thing. But the Word of God is different from any other book that's out there. It is authoritative. It's God's message to us. And as we look at God's Word, Bob, we can find all the answers we need, can't we? We absolutely can. You know, the, when we talk about the Word being binding upon us, I find it important for people to understand that that is true of us, but it was also true of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, uh, for example, just to take an example, when, when we go to the temptations of Jesus uh, in Matthew chapter 4, we have Jesus being tempted by Satan. And Satan tried to, to urge him to do something he shouldn't. Uh, and so he, he tried to get him to make stones bread. He'd been fasting 40 days. And Jesus would not. And he didn't just say no. But he said no with a passage of Scripture. And he said, it is written. But more than that, next we find him coming back, Satan coming back, and Satan tries to use Scripture against him. But he misuses Scripture. And Jesus will not allow Satan to bind Scripture on him. He turns it right around and he says, on the other hand, it is written. And Jesus was going to do exactly what Scripture had said. Okay. All right. So it is written, and that's our appeal, is what is written? What does the Bible say? Well, the Holy Bible is very important. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 tells us that, uh, that in sundry times and in divers manners, God in times past spoken to the fathers by the prophets, but He has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. We find that God speaks to us today. God has always communicated His will to mankind from the very beginning. In the Garden of Eden, Bob, he, he told Adam and Eve some rules, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> and the, the thing I've always enjoyed about that is that they only had one. Yeah. Uh, that we know of at any rate. And, and it wasn't a difficult rule, don't eat of that tree over there. Yeah. And that's, that's really not hard. And yet it became hard because it was mulled over in the mind. And so Eve looks and she begins to think about it. And, uh, you know, a lot of times, Stan, I, I find that, that that's the problem people have. It's they, they don't say no when sin comes up to them. What they do instead is they just think on it. And mm -hmm. it, it mulls over in their mind. Yeah. And, and, of course, James points this out in James chapter 1. And they let their own desires to yeah. take off with them. Exactly. 
The next event, I guess, would be when God spoke to Moses and to, to Noah that God is speaking directly in the first part of the, the Bible in Genesis, that He's letting man know what He has in mind and how He wants them to behave. And He doesn't take kindly to them telling Him no. And walking away, there's consequences to doing that, to resisting God. So God spoke in an audible voice to mankind. He spoke to Moses from the burning bush. He spoke to Moses as He talked to the people in Deuteronomy, the second generation. And He speaks to us today through His Word. But God also has spoken through angels in the past. Remember when Abraham uh, received the men that were actually angels that came to visit him uh, about Sodom. And God let it be known to Abraham what needed to be done. And then God has spoken also through prophets. Prophet Elisha, Prophet Elijah, uh, and several, all the prophets of the, of the Scripture, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel. We see that God has spoken through men in the past. But now we see that He speaks through Jesus and through the Word that Jesus said. Now Jesus spoke words. The words that He spoke were spirit and they were life. And these are the words that we can go by today. Now Jesus, when He left, what did He do? Who did He? He made a promise to the apostles. Okay. He said, I'll send My Spirit. He'll guide you into all the truth. All right. Now, does God send the Holy Spirit to you each, each day? No, not unless you're talking about through the Word of God. Okay. That's, that's the only way He sends okay. the Holy Spirit to me. All right. So, and, the, and this is one of the problems we have in the world today. We have people that everybody has a voice in their head. And the, the problem is when we begin to think that that voice is something other than our own voice. And, and I realize some of the times we have thoughts that we think, wow, that was really something. I, you know, I couldn't possibly have thought of that myself. Right. That, that, must, that must have been something from God. And, and I can understand someone wanting to think that, but the truth is God created our minds and He created us capable of, of great, wonderful thoughts. And uh, some of the times years down the line, those thoughts, we look back on them and they weren't so yeah. great after yeah. all. Yeah. But the truth is, the Holy Spirit is not speaking to us today, and if He is, why? Right. Is it because He didn't do a good job the first time? That, that's a big problem. Right, right. And when we, look at, when we look at what the Holy Spirit does today, Holy Spirit acts today, no doubt. The, the Word of God talks about the Holy Spirit and uh, how He speaks to us, and, there's no, and that we can have the Holy Spirit. All those that are in Christ, are, we have the Holy Spirit. But it, He does not have to come to us in some direct way. He, and like you said, what would the Holy Spirit tell us to do that the Word of God has not already told us? And we see that the Word of God is power. Now, the Word of God is not the Spirit. Let's be sure and clear about that. But the Word of God is the means by which the Spirit speaks to us today. Right. And this Word of God was delivered, the Holy Spirit delivered this Word to apostles and prophets and others, and they wrote it down. And we have a written Word, just like you talked about, that Jesus referred to. And the Scripture that Jesus had in His day, while He lived under the Old Testament law, was the Old Testament. And he abided by those things. He, he was involved in the writing of it and by the, by the very idea of a law. But he submitted himself to the law and obeyed the law as an example to us. And that's one of the challenges we have sometimes with, with uh, people who say, well, you know, you don't need to do anything. Well, our Savior showed us that you needed to walk in a particular way. And he taught us things. So as we look at what the Scriptures say, look if you will at 2 Timothy chapter, two, chapter 3 in verse 16 and 17 about how God speaks to us today. It's not a question of does God speak to us. I, Bob, I was having a Bible class uh, just a few months ago uh, with an individual in a different area and he said, uh, Doug, he said, you've been preaching for, over, for right at 50 years? And he said, no, you've never had the Holy Spirit? And I said, no, not like you're talking about. He said, I feel so sorry for you. And I said, well, I said, you know, I said, I don't believe that I've done anything wrong to you. He said, you seem like a good fellow to me. 
But he was very concerned that the Holy Spirit hadn't come to me yet. And I told him, I said, well, I said, I explained to them that the Holy Spirit does come to us through the Word as we re reflect and go into these things. And there are certainly things with all of us as we study the Bible, and I'm sure you found this out too, Bob, that, that they are, it's amazing that we didn't catch it earlier. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And no matter how long you've been in, in the kingdom, the more you study the Bible, the more you realize you don't know. And, uh, it, and when you do see it, it's like, it's like a light went on. And, uh, but it's, it's not anything supernatural at all. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says that all Scripture is what? Inspired of God. Okay, and the word inspired carries with it the idea that it is God-breathed. Uh, all Scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God might be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Now, just working on those last few words. you have any thoughts on that? Well, obviously, if I need more than the Word of God, then I need more than what Paul is telling Timothy here the Word of God is for. If, if it is going to make, if it is going to perfect or complete me, then what else do I need to make that completeness? Obviously, it's already there. But Paul is telling Timothy that the Scripture is the way that's actually accomplished. Okay. All right. And so the scriptures are the way. And so, again, what do we need in addition to that than what God has already given? God knows best. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21, you have that, Bob? I sure do. But know this first of all that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Okay. As they were moved by the Holy Spirit, one version says. In other words, God's involved in the actual breathing forth of the words, and they spoke that way. And they wrote down the things that they heard. And, and that, the, go I'm ahead. sorry. No, go, go right ahead. I, I just, I love the, the wording here when he says moved by the Holy Spirit. The, the, the word that Peter uses here for moved is a word that means to carry from one place to another. Mm -hmm. and, and so for the Greek who was reading this, it presented a picture for him of God actually using the Holy Spirit to move the mind of the prophet from where anybody else might want the message to go and to move that message to where God actually wanted it to be. And you know, as we, as we look at the Old Testament, we find that there is no way that the Old Testament prophets could have prophesied what they prophesied if the Holy Spirit hadn't been doing it. Mm -hmm. Not just because they were foretelling the future, but because they were foretelling things that a Jew would never foretell. Right. Who has, who has a hero that they are looking forward to coming, and then, as Isaiah does in Isaiah 53, you kill him off? That, that's, that's not a, a saga of a hero. That's, that's a saga of defeat. Uh, yes, the Old Testament does prophesy his resurrection, and yes, it was fulfilled. But there we find... Isaiah, and he is presenting the death of the hero. Uh, and yes, he died for the nation, but that's not what they were expecting. They really didn't think that that was what was coming. Yeah, they were looking for some, for a physical kingdom. Also, Daniel would have never prophesied as a, as a devout Jew about the coming of a great empire, uh, several great empires, uh, as he was a captive in Babylon. Uh, as a devout Jew, he would not be prophesying about the Greek Empire, or the Persian Empire, or certainly not the Roman Empire. Nor would he talk about a kingdom that would be set up in the days of Rome that would never fail. Jews just don't do that. No. And they were truly looking for a kingdom of a, of a gathering back of the Jews, just like many today are doing the same thing. So we had a question come in, Bob, and uh, the, the question is this, what is a, what is a spirit chapter and verse. And what is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Okay. All right. 
the the idea of a spirit is something that that comes all the way from the beginning of scripture we read of it right there at the beginning of the book of genesis we find the spirit of god was upon the face of the water uh, what is this spirit we know from uh, john chapter 4 in verse 24 that god is a spirit they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth the word spirit back here in the old testament was a word that literally it referred to breath but and and some of our religious neighbors they will tell us that's all spirit is they want to tell us that god uh god created us but he only created us with breath mm -hmm. and we don't have anything that survives the grave when you die that's it you're like rover you're dead all over uh, and yet when we turn to scripture we find that that is not the way that that word for spirit is being used it actually has other uses for example in ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7 we read about the death of a human being uh, all the way from verse 1 the wise man solomon he is he is encouraging the young remember therefore the crea the creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come when you say i have no pleasure in them and then he goes through a lengthy descript description of aging a person aging and then he comes down to that point where the the jar is broken the the life in other words ends and in verse 7, what does he say there, Stan? Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns unto God who gave it. Now my question is, what does God need with our breath if that's all it is? And yet, here we find the dust returning to the earth, which is the physical part of man, and we find the Spirit returning to God who gave it. Well, what would be the purpose of that? We find an indication of that when we turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and we read about the resurrection, uh, which again, this is another bone of contention with those who hold that position that an individual who dies, that just their breath leaving, there's nothing that survives. And we come to them and we say, well, what, what happens in the resurrection? And what they'll say is, well, God is going to recreate the person. Well, the interesting thing here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is that we have people who have died and we have them rising from the dead. But notice how he words it here. Beginning of verse 14 of 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Now wait a minute. Obviously the fallen asleep are the dead, and God's going to bring them with him, but we find as we go on down that that's not the body that he's bringing the body's in the grave and we learn that in verse 16 the lord descends from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of god the dead in christ rise first god is bringing something with him and it's something important and what it is is it's our spirits our spirits as we saw in ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7 that departs to go and be with god and now when the body is raised the spirit is going to be reunited and we're going to find this great and wonderful resurrection yep next part of that question is what about the indwelling of the holy spirit and I would like for you, if you would, to, for, to turn, if you would, Bob, there to, to first, that's first Corinthians chapter three, and let's look at verse sixteen. First Corinthians chapter three and verse sixteen says, "Do you not know that you are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you?" Okay. So there again, the indwelling of the Spirit is taught in the Scripture, that the Spirit dwells in us that our body is a vessel through which the Spirit dwells. But how does the Spirit dwell? That's the question. Not does it, not does the Bible teach it, but how does it? And I think we, all, we can very well see that the Spirit does not have to leave its position. Any part of deity that dwells in us, and we can find passages that talk about the Father dwells in us, the Son dwells in us, 
The Word dwells in us. The Spirit dwells in us. It's not a question of does the Bible teach that deity dwells in us or that the Word of deity dwells in us. It's how does it do it. It does it through the means of the Word of God. And just if we can show how God dwells in us, the Father, then we can also show how God the Spirit dwells in us. But in order to do that, going to what you were talking about from Genesis chapter, uh, the, uh, chapter 1, first chapter, Spirit of God moving on the face of the waters, we see also in the very word God, in the beginning God, that it's a plural word, Elohim. And so we see there that there is the, the Spirit of God there. We also find in other place, places that Jesus, without Him nothing was made that was made. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are present at creation. And the Trinity is taught throughout the Scripture to those that want to be oneness people, that only want to believe in the Father, or only be Jesus only people, and absent the Spirit. Then we have to take all of what the Scripture says. Once again, if we're going to go by this book, then we have to be abiding by what it says and know what's binding, what's not binding, what used to happen. Now, was there a time before the Bible? When God was speaking in different ways to people and through different means, yes, no doubt. But now, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, talks about that, thing, that, that situation and tells us that God who in sundry times and in different manners, there it is, in times past spoken to the prophets or the fathers by the prophets, He has in these last days spoken to us through His Son. And so we find there we're in the last times and that God has a New Testament that we are to go by and those 27 books of the New Testament are how the Spirit of God dwells in the Christian today. I dwell in, in the, the Spirit, the Spirit dwells in me. Now how do I dwell in the Spirit might be a question we would ask in, in return to this question. How do you dwell in the Spirit? By abiding by His Word. Okay. And that's, and the Spirit abides in us by giving us the Word to abide in. You see how that works? And that's, uh, so the, the, to the one that asked the question, thank you for that question, good question. And we appreciate it so much. It's a wonderful question and one that many people may have in, on their minds to ask also. And so we, we, we appreciate that. We're getting a lot of calls and we appreciate that also and we thank you. Another question has come in. Is the spirit and soul united? And are they considered the same? And if they are not the same, what's the difference? <laughs> That's the, a good one. <laughs> the spirit and soul. All right. Well, there are two. There are two main passages that that are brought up, um, and I and I think probably if neither one of these passages were worded the way that they are worded that the question would never arise. I think probably we would very quickly assume that the spirit and the soul are exactly the same thing. They're just different terms for the same thing. The first passage uh, that would come to mind is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, the Apostle Paul here is, is closing out this epistle to the Thessalonians and he has a desire for them. And 1 Thessalonians 5, reading verse 23, he says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to just keep your thumb there at that particular place, the second passage is in Hebrews chapter 4 uh, and verse 12. And here we have a reference that, that seems to indicate the idea of dividing the two, of actually uh, uh, slicing in as if dissecting and, and dividing between the two. So verse 12 of Hebrews 4 says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now let me deal with the second passage first. This particular passage has a statement in it of making a division of soul and spirit. The first thing that I would note here is it doesn't actually say that the soul and spirit are 
are divided in some way. It says it pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit, and it makes it very quickly sound like that. Uh, it has been suggested by some that there is a figure of speech here that is not really informing us that we can separate the the soul and the spirit, and there's a difference between joints and marrow, because this isn't an anatomy class, uh, and it, the point really is not that the soul and the spirit can be separated from each other. The point is how sharp that sword is, that it is so, so quick and so powerful that it can divide perhaps as far as the soul and spirit and make distinctions. That may possibly be the point. But that brings us back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which seems to indicate that we do have a difference here. And that is in the fact that he doesn't speak of spirit and body or soul and body. He says spirit and soul and body. And there's a, there is a possibility here that he has three different things in mind, but the soul and the spirit possibly are simply two aspects of this whole thing that the spirit is that which God has given and it is the the entity that that we have that we have no power over it animates us it gives us life but the soul on the other hand is that part that that we really see more evidence of mm -hmm. in other words uh, you've you've got intellect here uh, and you've got the animation not just causing life, but it also causes us to, to understand things that, for example, the, the animal creation would not understand. Uh, they do not, um, I, like to, I like to point out the fact that, as the wise man said, he hath set eternity in our hearts. What does that mean? Well, I, I point out the Serengeti, you know, a lion, he, he kills his prey and, and the pride here is chowing down on the prey and they're not all laying around chewing on the meat and, and saying, well, you know, I, I wonder if he went to heaven or hell. <laughs> you know, that, that they don't have any concept of anything surviving the grave. Human beings are the only ones that can think in that way. So it, it's very possible that the soul is that aspect of, of all of this. But you know, the, the one thing that really stands out in that question to me is the fact that there are times when God hasn't really just come down and said, here is exactly what you are to understand about this. Because as uh, as we find Moses pointing out, there are secret things of God. And we have to be very careful that we not try to make something out of those. And some of the times you can make a whole doctrinal system out of something that really came down to the secret things of God that we may not know for sure just exactly what God had in mind. Right. And uh, on, on Hebrews 4, verse 12, there's, there's, a, there's like a, a triplet of things here that are joined by and. And if you look at all of them that are said, you have the soul and the spirit, you have the bone and the, or the joint and the marrow, and the thoughts and intents of the heart. In every case, there's a fine line that divides that. And I think as you're talking about the figure of speech that is used there is saying even if uh, it could be done, that it could delineate even the finest thing b between us. Uh, is there a difference in soul and spirit? Possibly in some ways, like you're talking about. We have a conscience that convicts us. We have, uh, we read the Word of God. It goes into our hearts and our minds. Our heart is touched. We're moved by that. It is conscious effort. What is that? Could be soul, could be spirit. We could call it conscience in one of those ways. There is a soul that returns to God, uh, chapter 7, or, uh, or verse 7 of chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes. So again, I agree with you, Deuteronomy 29, 29, secret things do belong to God. There are some things that God has sought to give us enough information. You remember in Job, the last few chapters of Job, that God said, I'll tell you a little bit, and I'll sh but you weren't there <laughs> when I That's made right. you. And also to Habakkuk, when Habakkuk says, I don't understand why you would take a more wicked nation to overcome a less wicked nation. God says, well, I'll tell you a little bit, Habakkuk, and that's all I'm telling you. Yeah. And I think that principle is true here. The fact is, we are different. God made us different, 
we have a spirit that will return to God. We have a being that is within us. There's a part of us that is part of that breath of lives that was breathed into us at the beginning. That is that spark of God that will go back and answer to Him for what we have done in the flesh. And so all of that is, is there. But understanding all the nuances of any type of uh, indication here, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not that, that intelligent. <laughs> you know, so, and uh, not about to go there. Uh, there are some things we can answer with the Scriptures, and I think we've given you the two main Scriptures that answer the question here. And it only answers just to a point. There have been those that have observed, Bob, that when they get to heaven they're going to have a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that could be yes or no. Perhaps when we get to heaven we won't care about those questions anymore, the things that have yeah. troubled us all of our lives. So. Yeah. I, I think when, you know, I think about the scene in, in Revelation 21 and, and coming before God and when I, when I read that picture there that's painted for us, I read that and I think, you know, there, there are a lot of things I'd like to, to ask Jesus, that I'd like to ask, um, uh, I'd like to ask the apostles, especially Paul. And yet at the same time, I look at, at that description there and I think to myself, you know, when I get into the presence of God, I don't think I'm going to be thinking about any of that. God is so glorious. He is so magnificent that all I'm going to be able to do is praise and glorify Him. Mm-hmm. Yep. And looking forward to that. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. If you will, let's, now let's turn to John chapter 16. And we're going to put the chart that we've been using here in our presentation up for you to where we see what the Bible says about inspiration. And again, we're getting back to that idea of God breathing something into man. He breathed into man the breath of lives. Now He breathes into our spirit His inspired Word, His God-breathed Word. And He wants us, it's, it's going to supply us with things. It will not return to Him void. It will accomplish what He has set it to do. So in John 16 and verse 13 through 16, if you will, Bob, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify Me, for He shall take of Mine, and shall disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine, therefore I said that He takes of Mine, and will disclose it to you. A little while, and you will no longer behold Me, and again a little while, and you will see Me. Okay. So there is a specific order there in how God will be dealing with man and presenting His Word to him. And very specific in that. Now let's go to Ephesians 3, 3-5. Three through 5. You have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in few words, whereby when you read Now that anticipates something, doesn't it? When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets through the Spirit. See how beautiful those passages, John 16 and Ephesians 3, just blend together, folks, and how God tells us that the words that we have, the Bible, what we call the Holy Bible, is designed by God for a purpose. God made man, God knows how to deal with him. And he, when we read, we can understand. That anticipates something to be read. Now we know in the Old Testament that they had things that they read, they had scrolls, we find that they even lost the book at one time and, and discovered it. We find that some did, tried to destroy the, the parchments with Jeremiah's time and he, he wrote them again. So God's Word will stand when everyone else, every other book is being destroyed, God's Word will still hold true and will still be there, and will be the book by which we're judged. So. Again, inspiration makes it different. This book is different. And I've, I've said this in the, in the, on the last program when we talked about this subject, that I have a problem finding out what to do with the Bible. 
when it gets worn out, do you? <laughs> I just can't throw it in the trash can. No, no, yeah. I want to rebind it. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I send it off and have it rebound. Yep, yep, and uh, recycle it and re re go through it again. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Because it is, the, the pages aren't holy, the, the print's not holy, but the, the message is so beautiful and you just don't want to miss any of it. God's breathed Word to us today. What a blessing it is that we can have that. Now the Spirit of Truth in John chapter 16 and verse 13, when He, the Spirit of Truth, has come, He will guide you, watch this, into all truth. Now you just read that from John 16. Guided into all truth. What does all mean, Bob? <laughs> it means everything you're going to need. I mean, it, it doesn't, uh, all doesn't always mean just everything uh, without limit. Uh, but in this particular case, it has a context. And what it has to do with is what they are going to need, to need in order to be his apostles and to preach the word and to give the world what they need to know so that they can be saved. And so it's not everything and it's not even all truth. So it, it's not like he's going to tell us how to cure cancer or something like that mm -hmm. because there's a truth and God could tell us how to do that. But that's not what God is about. He's about saving us. And that's the all truth that he's, he's given, and he gives it through the apostles. That, and that goes back to your red letter edition, folks, yep. that they don't want anything except what the red letter in their Bible has to say. And yet you read in the red letters here in John 16 that those apostles would be guided into all truth. Right. Just kick it back over to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You have scripture inspired of God, and it's profitable for all. And so we have exactly what we need, whether it's in red, whether it's in the black and white. In either case, the Word of God is what we have to have for salvation. Right. In John 14, verse 26, He will teach you all things, and He will do what? He will bring to remembrance all things that I have said to you. So the Apostles' writings are not writings that you can ignore like you've just said, Bob. The things that I wrote to you, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, are the commandments of the Lord. Now that's a broad claim, isn't it, if it's not true? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if it's not true, then not only is it a lie, but it's also an audacious lie. It's, it's very boastful. It's very arrogant. Uh, and yet Paul proved, he, as, he, as he told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, he had performed the signs of an apostle among them. So, so anything like this, they know that this isn't, this isn't bragging. This is the truth of the matter. Right. Now the unfolding of the story of the New Testament is beautiful. The first four books of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are called the Gospels, which means the good news. And they're the, they relate to the life of Jesus on this earth. They were written by the apostles, Matthew and John, and the early disciples, Mark and Luke. And they are there for a reason, the writing of the Gospel. About the 60s, Mark was written. About the 70s, and uh, Matthew and Luke were written. And also John. So we have the Gospel, the message of Jesus. What better place to start in talking to us about Jesus Christ and about how his earth, how he came to this earth? Luke's account in Luke 2 about how Jesus was born, and then the other accounts about how he came through his life. Really, about three and a half years of Jesus' life are the most of the Gospels, and every one of them deals with only that particular period of time. I have another question here. Let's see if we can get all of our electronics together. Hello. Thank you for calling. Doing fine. How you doing? Thank you for tuning in tonight. Doing good. Lord be with you. I've called in before, about back a while back, hadn't been recently. Okay. Well, thank you for staying with us. Appreciate that. My name's Roy King. I enjoy your program and the openness of it to the Scripture. Well, thank but you. All of the things that he described about the Spirit, uh, he never uh, gave an answer to what a Spirit is. He just told me things about a Spirit, not what a Spirit is. The main thing, a Spirit has to be identified to a person, and they have to get that Spirit inside of them after they know what it is. And that's the only way they'll have a value on it as a Spirit is to understand what a Spirit is. And it's very carefully and hid deeply in the Bible. And uh, I just wondered if, if you knew. And are you using the same Bible as he is? 
Uh, what, I, New Americans, whatever. He's using New American, and I'm using King James tonight. Right. Well, I, I detected that in the scriptures being read, and we all have to be in the same Bible. It's complete togetherness God is looking for is that we all be in the same Bible, same page, mm -hmm. same chapter, same verse, same Jesus. And until that happens, the modern-day church is not going to come together that God's looking for. It's just not going to come together till we're in the same words. And the Bibles today are being changed. The Holy Ghost has been taken out of the Bible and calling it, still calling it the King James, even though they took the saving spirit of Jesus out of it, which is the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. If you take that out of the Bible, you can't be saved without Christ and His Spirit living in you. And they've taken that out of the new Bibles. I guess yours is, yours is old 1611, right? Uh, no, I, 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 I couldn't read the 1611 version. It's in old English. Well, if you look at uh, the 28th chapter uh, and the 19th verse of Matthew, uh, read that verse to me in your Bible. Well, Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 20 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you, and lo, lo I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Is that okay, right? Okay, they've taken the Holy Ghost out of it, which is the Comforter. Those are Jesus' words. Once you remove the Holy Ghost from the Bible, a person can't have that saving knowledge of Jesus and His Spirit. The Comforter is not God. The Comforter is a personal spirit of Jesus. And it's the Holy Ghost. If you remove the words Holy Ghost and change, it is a Holy Spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit is the Holy Spirit. It's the highest spirit that mankind can know and have in Him. It's the Spirit of God. But without the Spirit of Jesus coming first to you, you'll never receive God's Spirit in you until judgment day but not walking on this earth in the flesh okay and so when you remove the word holy ghost you remove the holy ghost which is the comforter according to jesus's words it will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever i've said unto you and that's what is done to the new bible and that's the way to deceive this next generation of people coming up that believe in jesus but are not saved by jesus walking in the flesh Okay. The judgment day is coming to every human being, and the preachers are going to be judged more harshly than anybody that's walking the face well, of this earth. That's exactly. And I think both of you are men of God that already realize that. Oh, absolutely, but absolutely. Mark, you're using the same Bible. Okay. Well, can can I clarify something, Roy? Um, uh, you you talk about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. So what you're saying is that. The, the the word ghost and spirit is where you have the bone of contention here. Is that is that correct, Roy? I'm saying that both are spirits. One is the personal spirit of Jesus, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, and the other spirit is God's spirit, which has to be identified. You read things about God's spirit, but to know what a spirit is and have Bible a Bible proof to turn to with the finger of God and point it out on the paper is what you got to have. And these are the seven spirits of God that's being revealed to mankind on the earth now. He can either fight it or he can say, I don't know. I've been wrong about some things, but I want it. If I'm mixed up, please help me. And that's what, that's what I say to you. If I'm wrong and mixed up, you please help me. And that's the attitude we've got to take towards each other. Oh, absolutely. God's spirit is the highest spirit in the kingdom of God. And the second spirit to God is Jesus' spirit. And all the other spirits that enter into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, are Holy Spirits, but they're not the Holy Spirit. And these seven spirits of God are being revealed to mankind now through the words of Christ. The first spirit that you'll learn about, y'all have indicated about it, but you didn't point it out, has to come from the word of Jesus. Nobody else can reveal this man to man. 
Okay, Let me, well, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Bob. The, you still haven't really answered the question I was asking. Uh, you know, between the King James and the New American, you're seeing something in the wording. You're saying that the New American has removed something, and, and I'm trying to, to figure out what in the wording of the, you know, I, I, you know, all the other passages aside, you're saying that New American has taken something out, and the only, the only difference I can see is the word ghost in the word spirit. No, no the, the Holy Ghost is a spirit, but it's not the same spirit as God's spirit. Okay, but, but see what... The spirits of God are being revealed to mankind now in our last final days. Well, aside... Ghost, aside the a, 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 of Jesus, that's his yeah. spirit. Yeah, aside from that, you're still saying that something's taken out of here, and it says uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and whether it uses the word ghost or it uses the word spirit or whatever it uses, you know, you still haven't defined for me okay. how that's coming out of there. Let me tell you this. Uh, the, Holy, the Father is the Holy Spirit. What they're saying in that verse is the Father, the Son, and the Father. God is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus' Spirit is a Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Oh, he said okay. These names, he said, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. I am to introduce you to God, tell you His name, what His Spirit is, the name of God's Spirit. I am introduce you to the Son, Jesus Christ. I am to you introduce you to the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Okay, so what we have here... Hey, Roy, Roy, let, let us answer you, okay? Okay, go ahead. All right, Roy. okay, all right, there you go. Okay, Thank you. So, Thank so you. what we have, uh, you know, some of the answer to this is going to come in this presentation as it goes forward, mm -hmm. because we're going to talk about the, the translations, the English translations, where did they come from? And you know the the um, the assumption that has, has come down through time. You know this this isn't the first time that I, I've come upon this argument, uh, and that's why I zeroed on, in on that word ghost there. Uh, it, it's assumed that the word ghost there was something that is different from other passages that use the word spirit. And the truth is, the word there for Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit is, you know, that, that hagias numas that is there is the same as every other place where it says Holy Spirit. Uh, it uses the same words here in this particular text right here. The question is, why did the King James translators use the word ghost? Well, first of all, they were using what was actually used before them. Uh, one thing that we miss is that the King James Version actually was not a translation. Now, don't, don't let me lose you. Some people, they just go ballistic when I say that. But the, when the King James Version was commissioned by the king, there were certain rules that were, uh, that were set out. And I believe, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was Article 14 out of those rules stated that they were to use the bishop's Bible yep. as the standard for that, <clears throat> and it was only to be changed from the bishop Bible by the use of other versions like Tyndale's and Coverdale's and Matthew's Bible and so on and so forth. And then, if they could not come to a consensus between the versions, then they would go to the Greek and they would uh, settle any discrepancies there from that. Uh, so the, the word ghost was already in place. It's assumed that the word ghost came out because there was a desire to hide from mankind the truth about the Holy Ghost. And in fact, the word ghost over, in 1611, the word ghost worked great. It was a word that was perfectly uh, useful for that purpose. As time went on, however, translators saw a change in that word ghost in the English language. And the word ghost suddenly became this, this apparition at the end of a hallway in a haunted house. And that was undesirable to, to convey the Holy Spirit in those terms. And so what they did was they changed to a consistency. 
they started translating that same word the same way in every passage where it was found. The word pneumas is the word for spirit, and it's used here, it's used in all of the other passages that we've used uh, in the New Testament this evening, and they decided, let's make it consistent between all of those, because they were all talking about the same thing. Right. And then, now as we go on with this study, we'll find a lot of the verification of what I've been, what I was just telling you about the translation itself. I'm not saying that the King James was not a good translation. Uh, if it wasn't, I'd be saying, Stan, why in the world <laughs> well, are you using that? Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I grew up uh, using the, the uh, King James Version. Uh, memorized a lot of Bible passages. To this day, I will, I will translate passages. Uh, for example, I cannot memorize uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, uh, you know, which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. I can't get that out of my head. That's King James. But th the thing is, over time, I was studying with people who uh, uh, they, they were people who were not uh, as good a readers as you or I might have been. And I saw that there was a great deal of difficulty on their part understanding the word order that w it was in. And so I moved to something else. But as we're going to see in this study uh, that, that Brother Adams is going to continue in uh, for the next several programs, I understand, we're going to see that the translators actually went to a great deal of trouble to see to it that the Bible got into English accurately. And if they made mistakes, we still have the Greek and we can go back to that Greek and we can look at it and see if they did in fact make the mistake. Right. In John 14, in John, Roy, Roy and John, uh, Roy, Roy. Presented is the fact that you're ignoring what Jesus said. And that's where, that's where the breakdown of communication between all of the churches are. They okay. refuse to go to the words of Jesus and, and get together on what Jesus said to answer these questions. And because they're doing that, they're doing it for one reason only, because they do not want to obey Jesus. They will not keep the words, keep the sayings, and keep the commandments of Jesus. They will not humble themselves to the living Spirit of God that He sent here by Jesus, His Word. Okay. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. And so I summon you to forget the rest of it. You can throw the rest of it in the trash can as far as your salvation except what Jesus said. And come together in the words of the Lord Jesus because that's the only thing that's going to save this, this poorly uh, recognized church, modern day church today. They're Roy, all living in the sin of the world. Roy. Committing sin daily but they know wrong, preachers included. Hey, Roy. saying there's no way out of it. Roy. There is a way out. Yeah, go ahead, preacher. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. You're, it's almost becoming your show. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, you know how it is. You start talking I, I know, I know, I know. Uh, I, I know you're not saying that what Jesus said to his apostles, that he would, the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. I don't think you meant to say that what the apostles had to say can go in the trash, did you? No, I said as far as your salvation. This can't be revealed man to man. What I've got, I can't reveal to you. All I can do is testify to you of the words of the Lord Jesus, and that should bring me, you and I together. Right. If I'm lost, and you probably think I am mixed up, you ought to help me. I'm and trying. Know that I'm trying, but you got to let me talk, bro. These are two different spirits. Yeah, Roy. I'm trying. I'm trying to, to talk with you now. Let me have a chance, okay? Yes, in, in John 14:26, it says there the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So there you have something called the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. You have the Trinity there, don't you? Why did they change wait, it from the Holy wait. Ghost? Well, you get rid of the word comforter, they got to, they think they're okay the way they are. They're not comforted. Well, they believe, they don't believe it, like you said, the soul, they don't believe it down in their soul, which is the deepest part of their spirit. They say, oh, I believe so. I, that sounds like they doubt it. You know, 
I believe this, uh, you know, that they might believe a number of things that might be wrong, but somebody is with the finger of God is going to point out to the words of Jesus on the same Bible that they're all using and agreed on, and they're going to have to humble themselves to the words of the Lord. Okay. And that's what, I know that's what you're trying to do. I can feel it in both of your spirit. Right. Well, the thing is, let, let, me, let me mention this. Um, will you stay with the program tonight? Yes, sir. Okay. We, uh, will you get back on the air with one of our uh, operators because we need, to, we need to study this together and to come to, okay. con- come to a good conclusion, and we don't have the time tonight to handle that, but we will certainly deal with that, okay? You got some time to, to spend with us? Yes, I'll do that. Okay. I love you in the spirit of the Lord. Oh, same here. Same here, Roy. And we appreciate your, appreciate your conviction. Um, and again, we're, we, we're kind of at an impasse here on some of these, and are, we're not able to sure. communicate on all like we want to. So get back on the op, uh, with the operator, and uh, let's get your address, and let's have a home study on this, okay? Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time, and I love both of you in the Lord, and I believe you're on the right track for God's Word. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you, too. Thank you, Roy. Yes, sir. All right, a lot of a lot of what Roy was saying there, um, we we do have. Um, th- there's just a lot of material to cover, yeah. and um, again, we are not putting him off. We are going to go study with him, and he's leaving his address right now for us. So uh, we are going to do that. But what we wanted want to deal with uh, in in some of the things he said to kind of close that down. Um, the Trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, no doubt. The Spirit is, the Spirit does deliver the Word to us. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of, of the Holy Spirit, He's trying to make a difference at each one, each personality of the Godhead is the other. And they are three distinct personalities of the Godhead. And that's what I was getting. Is that is that? Yeah, you, yeah you, I, be, I believe that that's exactly uh, what it's coming down to. I, I haven't run across this doctrine in in uh, quite some time, but um, uh, that's that's what I believe that that he was actually getting at. Right, and so we'll we'll be talking with him about that. But the the personalities of the Godhead, the Trinity, is is expressed as you see it uh, at Jesus' baptism. The Father is speaking from heaven. The Spirit is descending as a dove, and the, Jesus Christ is dwelling in the flesh. The Son is in the flesh, and so the Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Son, and neither one of them are the Spirit. They are distinct personalities of the Godhead. All the Godhead being one, Ephesians 4, but yet the oneness of the Godhead is also delineated there with Father, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, in you all. So that doesn't argue that there is one better than the other one or one higher than the other one. Uh, They all exist and they are all personalities of the one God through the Godhead. And uh, that is uh, a a very deep discussion and a discussion that we, we need to have with Roy and we appreciate him calling in as we do all of our callers calling in and we'll be courteous and but we do have to we do have a show to do and we have to move on so uh, again we would love to spend all kinds of time on just one question but we can't do that it's not fair to you as an audience and so we're going to try to move on to some other things tonight in first Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13 the things that we speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches but that which the Holy Spirit teaches. We also speak not in words that man's wisdom tells us. So what Paul is saying here is the things he was telling the Corinthians was not something he just made up. You know, right. He just didn't come up with a good idea and think that everybody needed to hear it. You know, uh, He was speaking things that mattered. And uh, so the, the claims of the early writers, uh, Papias and Irenaeus, uh, uh, about the Gospels. Uh, there are those that try to make a distinction in the Gospels and say that the Gospels were basically uh, things that somebody got from other sources. And they weren't. 
they, they, that's just not right. Uh, the, all of the all the church fathers would would uh, testify to that. The historians of the time period, and we we have several charts that we could throw up on that. But they're just not. It's just not there. Um, so all Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the story of Jesus. No one uh, borrowed it from the other one, and it wasn't didn't come from some legend or some myth. Uh, and, and somebody just decided to write a neat story. First of all, you couldn't have the unity <laughs> that you have in Math Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> even even if they draw from the same source, they're they're still going to get connecting points wrong. Right. And uh, when you when you put the gospels together, although some try to find. Uh, uh, discrepancies between them, um, contradictions. There actually aren't any. They, they they dovetail together perfectly. Yes, they do. They sure do. And looking at our Bible, just just looking at the New Testament. Let's let's look at this chart for just a minute. Let's let's divide it down here. The Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the 27 books in the New Testament, divided down into the life of Christ. The first four books. The second book, or the volume two, would be the book of Acts, which is a history of the early church from beginning to end. Uh, well, the end of the first century. Anyway. <laughs> and then letters to churches uh, that Paul wrote and others. Uh, th th these were all written by Paul, Romans through Second Thessalonians. And then we see letters to individual Christians in First, Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and Third John. And then we see also the general epistles. Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd John, and Jude. And then finally, the prophecy, only, only prophetic book in Scripture is the, is the book of Revelation. So the early church uh, used the New Testament books. Um, the New Testament in the, in, uh, in the early church writings, uh, the New Testament was preserved. And what we want to do for just a moment on that, Bob, is just kind of discuss a little bit about providence if, you, if you've got uh, anything on that. If God told us that we're going to read something and it's going to be written and we'll be able to read it, we'll be able to understand it, He was anticipating that He was going to be delivering that to mankind, don't you think? Yeah, the interesting thing about providence is, is we would like to know just exactly all the details of it. And, and the truth is, not only are we not going to know all the details of it, uh, but we're also not going to understand how he actually did it. So we see providence a lot in the Old Testament. Uh, some of those places we can just know that his providence was at work. It was bringing his will about. And now we have promises that are given with regard to the Word of, of God. Now, what if someone decided that they were going to corrupt the Word of God so that the world could never, uh, could never actually understand what God wanted us to know to be saved? Well, do I know anybody that would want to do that? Well, yeah, he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, yeah, right. First Peter 5 and verse 8. Yeah. And so I have someone who wants to do that, but he doesn't get to do it. He has a lot of allies on earth that he could help to do it. But God is going to, in whatever way he needed to, we don't know where he might have needed to step in, and we don't know how he stepped in, but we do know that he was going to see that his promises in the New Testament were kept because we know God does not lie. Right, right. And again, the unity of Scripture, there's all kinds of arguments could be made about the authenticity of Scripture just from the unity. If you sat down and wrote your view of an accident and I sat down and wrote my view of it, <clears throat> it probably wouldn't be the same. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like the old, uh, the old uh, myth about yeah, how many people just can describe an elephant the same way? You know, how many blind men can develop can do that? Well, mm -hmm. all of them writing again. You've got years separating people, and but yet all of the scripture works together. It's a beautiful book, and the central theme of the Bible is God's redemption of mankind. The main character of the entire Bible is Jesus Christ, and the the story of the Bible begins with. Uh, everything coming into existence, time here for us. And then we see that the tree of life is put in the midst of the garden. Man, if he hadn't uh, gone the other way, <laughs> would have had access to live forever through that tree of life. 
access to that tree was lost when man sinned and walked away from God. And access to that tree is regained in the book of Revelation. So in between is the beautiful message of the unfolding of God's plan for mankind. And it is absolutely beautiful. Well, uh, looking at the, at, at the church fathers and how they would, they would go, by the way, what do we mean by church fathers? Well, we're talking about those, those, those early um, patristic writers, we call them. They're, they're the fathers uh, who were at the, the beginning. It's not that they had children and offspring. Uh, it's, it's like uh, George Washington being the father of this country. Well, their fathers, not in the sense that they originated anything uh, inspired, but that they were writing important things about the history of the church and we learn uh, from them. Uh, although we don't learn what truth is, nothing can give us that but no. God's Word. But they tell us just exactly how that truth was received and how it was applied. It teaches about the church. And, and one thing that it does is it teaches us about apostasy as it came along. But the interesting thing about them showing us how apostasy came along, they also are showing us about that Word of God and it coming along, and it's a different picture than the apostasy. Yep, yep. And the apostolic fathers is just a term applied to the uh, earliest Christian writing after the New Testament. And again, it, it's their impression of what they've heard. Mm -hmm what they've heard. And so they would even write, they even wrote books that we've, we've discovered and found and have, have copies of, uh, First and Second Clement, the Epistle to Barnabas, and so on. These are, these are not inspired books of the Bible, but they're observations, they're men's comments, just like you might have a, a paper today uh, where men are writing articles uh, or a tract, like we were advertising on the program. Mm -hmm. This is not the Scripture, but it is taken from what we've heard from the Scripture and their observation. That, and that's helpful to us, like you said, to know that people on closer to the time of Jesus, closer to the time of the Apostles, that they were practicing the same things we're practicing. Yeah. And that, that just, it, it, that, it's not necessary for our faith to be stronger, but it certainly does help strengthen our faith. Mm -hmm. It also gives us warning because it does. they show us how quick apostasy can come. Right, and the apostasy was working right then. Yeah, that that's first, right. first departures. That's right. In Galatians 1 6, I marvel you're so soon removed from him that called you. Uh, some will trouble you and will pervert the gospel. So uh, it shows that it was being done, and we better watch out too. Um, and again, like Roy was saying, we all have to be accountable for what we say and what we teach. And those of us that preach and teach God's Word have to be very, very conscious of that. Amen. Uh, because um, it's like a, when I was working in the jails out in Texas, the, um, one guy told me, he said, you preachers have it made because all you got to do is say God said something and mm -hmm. everybody's going to do what you say. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I said, that's not how it goes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it, it, what the point he's making is it's a responsibility. Yeah. And it's not, it's not something that you ever should take lightly. And we've made points in the program here several times, that, like Roy has made, that we, uh, we do not need to follow any man, but we do need to follow what the Scripture teaches. But we need to make sure that we have what the Bible says and not what we think it says. And we need to make sure that we're always able to take off the glasses of what we have always thought and put on the glasses of what God wants us to think. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's an important thing for all of us, uh, to come to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, God did not give us a book that's so confusing we can't understand it. Uh, in John 17, we all can believe and we all can come and be one. And that's why we have the Scripture, exactly. is to bring us to oneness, not to, not to disharmony, but harmony. Yeah. So the apostasy coming, um, Matthew 7, 15, Jesus warned what? Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Okay. I guess something was coming, right? Something was coming, and it would look good <laughs> right. on the outside. So again, the Word of God given to us by God to help guide us into all truth. He warned us of false teachers. Again, when we see the, the, the application of all these things, there is a word that comes in here that God is anticipating and God's in control. It's not direct operation, it is providence. And providence, if I understand it pro properly, is that 
It's not God taking over free will, but utilizing whatever actions men take, even false teaching, even apostasies, things such as that, that would be an attempt by Satan to try to destroy the truth, to destroy the Word, and God being victorious over all of that in bringing about, even from the horrible things that happened, bringing about His purposes. Is that kind of how you see it? Yeah, yeah. Providence is a providing beforehand. And so in, in some way, of course, God knows what's going to happen. And so he puts, he puts the dominoes in a row all the way back here. Mm -hmm. and, and we like to think that, that what God always did was he was always working miracles to get things done. But what amazes me more about the acts of God in Scripture is it's not the miracles, and I and I'm not and I'm not lessening them. I'm not, you know, making light of them, because the power of God in those miracles is what showed men that God was at work in the ones who were working those miracles. But when He did it by providence, you know, God could just bend or break a law of nature and make something happen. And I can intellectually, I can I can understand that. I'm not saying I could do it. I could repeat it. I'm not saying I know how He does it, other than the fact that. He just made it happen by breaking the laws of nature. But he can do that. He's God. But how does he, knowing that he wants something to happen uh, four or five hundred years, a thousand years from now, how does he set the dominoes up right here so that they actually are going to fall exactly the way he wants them to fall? No miracles involved. He just has everything lined up and everything is naturally going to take its course so that he gets done what he wants done. That's, that's just, that's mind blowing to me. It's just so amazing. Yeah. And that man without even any knowledge of what he's doing and there's not any direct interaction with God on him to take over his free will that he takes, for instance, and names a man's name 150 years before he's born yeah. and says, Cyrus will be the one that would deliver my people. Yeah. And names him. Names him. Yeah. Um, and, and that someone will betray me. He doesn't name Judas, but there's going to be a Judas out there somewhere. There's going to be someone going to betray Christ. If it hadn't been Judas, it had been somebody. Yeah. And again, without taking over the free will, all of these things come. And, and when, that, when that comes into the idea of how, how can we rely on this, ber this word that we have to be true, again, as was brought up by Roy, with all the changes that have gone on, gone on with it, from the idea of coming from the Syriac to the, uh, and taking Aramaic, putting the Syriac, and then you have Russian language, you have the Asian languages. How can we have people from all different areas have translations in their languages and still have the same message? That's providence. Mm -hmm. God taking the languages of whatever they are, and there's new languages coming up even today. And taking those languages, and even in some cases, before the word was written down, people having to invent an alphabet to write it in. So, how does, <laughs> who could do that except God? And the order and the beauty of it be the same regardless of the translation. Um, to Roy, one of the questions we'll be talking to Roy about is how do you take how do you take an, a, a King James Version Bible and apply it in the King James original, but yet it be translated into Spanish? You can't. And you can't go to the 1611 version of the, of the uh, King James Bible and even read it today. Um, I, I did some, some work in, in, the, in English uh, back in college and trying to read the Old English <laughs> and pronounce it like they pronounced it, yeah. spell it like it was spelled, you, you can't read it. The, the average person could not take the, the, the original 1611 Bible. Now what we have and people call the 1611 version is nothing in the world but, but a translation of it. Mm -hmm. Because it's not, the, it's not how it was written. So unless someone is going to, the King James people that sit back and say 1611 only, okay, then you're going to have to use that one. 
And you're going to have to prove to people from that one what they have to do. We had a member in Louisiana that that was him. It had to be the King James Version. There was no, and of course, it's called the authorized version in the front. That's not what authorized, it doesn't mean authorized right. by God. It was authorized by the king. By the king. But, yeah. but he said, that's the authorized version. That's the one that you have to use. Right. Um, you know, and I, you know, he's a very intelligent man, very smart man. Uh, one of the other men in the congregation, uh, you know, he tried to reason with him. And finally, uh, one Sunday, he brought one. Uh, one of the original, uh, not an original printing, but a, a facsimile of the original printing. And he said, here, use this. And he opened it up. He couldn't read it. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, it was impossible. Right. And again, the principle there is going back to the idea of, with the speaking in tongues. If there is no interpreter, then what's the use? If there's no way to understand what's being said, what's the use? Well, God's Word is a communicated Word. Now, Let's go. Let's switch horses a minute. The dignity of the of the King James Version. I agree with that. There is dignity. There is reverence. There is certainly a beauty and a a poetry to the King James Version that I prefer in a lot of ways. But that does not argue that the American Standard, New King James, and the, the American Standard, New American Standard, that they are somehow flawed versions. Um, Again, what we're looking at is words that have changed, like you're talking about ghost and spirit. Uh, other things, surety, the term surety. We use the term stand good for somebody. Um, you know, they, 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 these are words that are used to communicate the same thought that is there. The word prevent in First Thessalonians 4, uh, they shall not prevent them. Uh, right. And what he is saying there is they shall not precede them. Right. Uh, but if you read that in the King James Version, you think, well, in some way the dead are not going to be, you know, the prevention of something. And that's not the way that word was being used there in 1611. Exactly. Exactly. Now, uh, the Gnostics were some of the ones, some of the first ones in the first century. And you can see the hints of this throughout the throughout the, the New Testament. They were the ones that, that were trying their their best to undo every bit of good that God was doing, and they were they were writing the false stuff and putting it out there as well. This is inspired too. Some of the things that the false doctrines of the Gnostics were is the God of the Old Testament was not the Father of Jesus, but just an evil God of war and evil. Um, Jesus didn't actually come in the flesh, they said, but only appeared to come in the flesh. Um, the wicked people of the Bible were char uh, characterized by the Gnostics as heroes sometimes. Uh, Cain and Judas and the Sodomites uh, revered, they, revered and, <laughs> instead. Yeah, they understood better than, than yeah, anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and they, they knew more. Mm -hmm. they, they just knew it better. They were the smart ones and everybody else was the dumb ones. And, and that's pretty much what the, the Gnostics were. They were kind of a, an intellectual elite that uh, we know a whole lot more than anybody else does. And again, it took, the, it took the gospel away from the common person and put it into a concept in their minds that you had to be some type of a genius in order to read the Bible and understand it yourself. And that, and that lasted for several years. Um, again, how do we know that the words, the, the, the books we have in the Bible are script, are the ones we need to have? Well, there were, there were things that you have to look at. One of them is unity. They have to be in unity with all other truth. And uh, again, looking at that, we see that God had, a, had a, a way to do that. So how do we have, how do we know that we have the proper canon of the Bible? Bob? Well, as you say, there are certain criteria that, that the, any inclusion of, of a writing into what we call the Bible, it's going to have to meet those criteria. You know, one that always stands out in my mind is the timing. It's going to have to be something that appeared early on. If it's not, if it's not early, then it's late. And if it's late, then it's too late. Yeah. Uh, and so I look, to, I look to the books of the New Testament, for example, and if, if they don't appear on the scene until 400 uh, AD, AD 400, then you know, how can I say that 
this is something that was written in the first century mm -hmm. because everything there was supposed to have been written in the first century. Right. So we need something that's early, that, that's way back there uh, toward that beginning so it can be written by the apostles and the prophets of the first century. Right, right. And when, when we look at that, on the, on the idea, we see that in Scripture. Paul said that when you read these things in the churches, they're to be read in all the churches. So they were reading something in the churches, the epistles that Paul was writing, they were reading them right then. Right. So they were authoritative then. The, um, another criteria would be the contents of it. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it's going to contradict other writings, then something's wrong here. Just as, as you brought up earlier, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, we have here the fact that these Galatians were so soon removed. And what was, what was happening here? There's another gospel being preached, uh, which is really not another, only some are perverting. And he tells them whether we or an angel from heaven should preach to you another gospel. And so if there's something different, and, and we can see a, a hint of that in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, mm -hmm. uh, where in verses 1 and 2, he, he warns the Thessalonians about anyone who might send them a letter as if it were from Paul. Yeah. He says, you need to beware of that. And, and the, the issue at hand there was that there were some who were teaching that the day of the Lord had come. Mm -hmm. Well, the day of the Lord hadn't come. And so that epistle's false. How can we know that? Well, it contradicts what is written elsewhere. So when we come, when we come upon writings, uh, for example, the Gnostic writings that you were speaking of earlier, we come upon them and they're teaching something different than what we find in our New Testament, then it can't belong in the New Testament. Um, and I just might point out one problem that some people have, uh, and that is the idea that, well, the New Testament does have contradictions in it. And they say, so why not include these other writings, these apocryphal writings, the Gnostic writings? Why don't we include them? Because after all, two contradictions, that's no worse than one. So why not do that? Well, the truth is, your New, Te your New Testament does not contain contradictions in it. Nope. There are contradictions alleged by men. Uh, for example, they will point out the um, uh, they 'll point out the um, uh, Jesus entry into Jericho uh, and the healing of a man and they 'll point out that in one gospel he was coming into Jericho and in another gospel he was going out of jericho i don 't deny that that 's exactly what it says. Mm -hmm. but did you know that in the New Testament times there were three Jerichos yeah. And one of those gospel writers is writing from the Roman point of view. And another gospel writer is writing from the Jews point of view. If you don't look at it very carefully, it may look like a contradiction, but it's not a contradiction. We have to be very careful of, of accusing the Bible of things. Right, right. And uh, another one that comes to mind with me is the, is the problem people say, well, the writers didn't agree on how Judas died. <laughs> no. Yeah, some said he hung, that he hung himself, and then another place it says that he that he fell and bur burst asunder. Right. Well, if you hang somebody and they they sit in the sun very long, they're going to swell up and they're going to burst. Yeah. So there's not a contradiction, but if you want to see a contradiction, you'll see it. Yeah. If you're trying to disprove it, but. Um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Assuredly, that's, that means you can, you can rely on this. I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot and one tittle will by any means pass from the law until everything is fulfilled. So, God, the Word of God, and when Jesus died, some of the words He said in His dying breath was, It is finished. Uh, I have accomplished what I came to accomplish. He had lived the law perfectly. He had uh, done the, done what he came to do, and the old law was closed, closing, died, nailed to the cross, and was fulfilled. And uh, 
he goes, uh, Peter, uh, in what he says about these things, is 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And, you know, in, in an age when people are trying and, and have continued to try to just discount God's word, and even in our country, people saying, no, we don't need those old ideas anymore. We need to get with it and we need to be progressive, and there's no, nothing more backward than the current progressivism. Um, but we, we need to get back to the Bible, and we need to get back to what God wants us to do. It is righteousness that exalts the nation, and God's Word is going to endure forever. Now, the acceptance of the, of the early church writings, and what you were saying there about the, about the going, going the timeline all the way back to the New Testament, uh, what did the early church accomplish? What did, they, what did they do? They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread and prayer. What was this apostles' doctrine? Can we know that? Well, we see from the writings that are extra-biblical writings that they were actually doing the things that the Scriptures say they were doing. Um, the Council of Nicaea in 325 um, addressed some of the things we're talking about, about the nature of Christ and the Gnostic heresies. And um, some people said that the Council of Nicaea decided what was in, what books we could have and what we didn't. How would you address that? Oh, no, absolutely not. Uh, I would address that by saying go and study history. You know, that, this, this is a lot of the problem. Yeah. Pe people make all kinds of assertions, and a lot of times it's because it's, it's something that we've heard someone say that we trust. You know, I've, and, and I will admit it, I have done this in the past. I've had someone that I trusted implicitly, and, and I believed that they had studied it out, and I thought that they had the truth on it, and I repeated it, and someone called me on it. Mm -hmm. And I went back, and I, I looked at it, and I studied it, and sure enough, they had it wrong, and I had it wrong. And, and when you start talking about church history, the Council of Nicaea, you start talking about various synods and, and all of the things that actually happened back then, you need to go back there and you need to see for the, yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've heard people say, well, you know, there, there really isn't any historical evidence that Jesus ever existed. <laughs> really? Have, have you ever gone back and studied the history on that? You know, they've heard a college professor say that, and they pick it up and they believe it. Well, you know, they're, they're, you have Roman historians, you have Jewish historians, you have the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, you know, there are just too much to deny that Jesus ever existed. And when we talk about what's in our New Testaments, if you go back and you study the Council of, uh, of Nicaea, that wasn't even the purpose for mm -hmm. their meeting, and they did not compile a list of the accepted uh, books of the canon. Right. And once again, it's like for, what was it, for several hundred years everybody thought the earth was flat? And <laughs> yeah. they were convinced of it mm -hmm. until somebody went out and tried it, mm -hmm. tested it. And they found out, and then everybody said, uh-oh, we've been wrong. Mm -hmm. It's possible for any of us uh, to be that way. And again, don't just say something is the way it is if you haven't looked, at, looked into it. Right. And that's, that, that's an important point for all of us. Let's not just take what somebody's told us the Bible says, like Roy did, and he did the right thing. Where's the book, chapter, and verse? Absolutely. And that's what we need to have, is have the book, chapter, and verse for what we're doing. Uh, councils did not determine what the Bible, what, what books of the Bible we're supposed to have. Catholic Church did not determine that. Uh, the New Testament Gospels, the Epistles, and the Prophets were, were complete and viewed as an inspired Word of God by the end of the first century. And we're commonly being recognized that way. So we can be assured that our English Bible is the complete, accurate, and wholly inspired will of God. One of the main reasons that we brought up to start with is God's providence, that He is going to provide us a book that is so fashioned in the language that it was delivered in to begin with, that it is so adaptable that we can read it in Chinese, Portuguese, whatever we want to, and we can come up with the truth of what we need to do to go to heaven. Yeah. And, and I don't know of anyone 
that could write a book, that could communicate that well. And that has to argue providence. God was watching. And uh, I think that even in one of the cases, there was an entire book, one of the oldest uh, remnants we have of New Testament Scripture was destined for the fireplace. <laughs> and it didn't get there. A guy found it, got to reading it, and it ended up being one of the oldest copies we have of, the New Te of a New Testament passage. Well, I think you're referring to the Sinaiticus yes. manuscript. Yeah. 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 And, um, and it was, it was it's, it's just amazing. Somebody says, how come it didn't make it to the fire? I don't know, <laughs> except it didn't. Yeah. And God's hand is in all of these things, I believe, in, in, in those things without taking over free will, without saying, you know, the, the guy was, evidently somebody was, needed some, something to warm the fire, warm, warm his fire. So, don't know that except that God was preserving His Word for mankind so that we could have a chain all the way back and be assured that what we are doing is something from God, is, is doing what God wants us to do. Um, here we get into some of the history of the English language or of the English versions, and this hits on some of what um, Roy was bringing up. Um, the 1611 version of the, new, of the, of the King James Version, um, again, you had already the translation of the Bible in Syriac in the 200s, second and third centuries. Uh, the, the dialect of the Syriac Version uh, was used in the regions of Antioch. Uh, most widely uh, accepted version was called the Peshitta or Peshitta, meaning the word pure. And so then from that you had the Coptic uh, translations, uh, you had the, uh, again, the Gothic translations, and on and on and on. So you're several generations from the original language. And I think that's something, like you were talking about, that a lot of people assume that 1611 was the first time we had any translation of, a, of an original text. Yeah. And there was many before that. And uh, so again, that assumption can lead you to a number of different uh, different ideas. Yes, and and you know these these translations. You know, I I, I can't read Aramaic. Uh, I can't read Coptic. Uh, there was a there was a Coptic church not far from where we lived in Houston. Um, the um, the Latin. Um, Vulgate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Latin Vulgate, the 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 common man's Latin. Even though I can't read those, those were invaluable, and I can, uh, in fact, I do have uh, many of those on uh, my computer, uh, and I can go to those, and if I look up the words, I can find the words that were used in the Latin to translate the Greek to see how they treated right. those, those words. Right. Uh, and I can go all the way back to the Greek, I can look at the Greek, and I can see uh, how they were actually intended to go into our translation. So even, you know, it may seem academic, you know, th this is heady stuff, why are we going there? The truth is, this is all about how it came down to us in order for us to see that this really, really makes a big difference and shows us how accurate and how trustworthy what we have is. Exactly. Exactly. And so when we're told in Mark 16, 15, 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel, we can know what the gospel is. Exactly. <laughs> uh, otherwise, we're just going and preaching whatever we please. Yeah. Uh, so there's a unity. Preach the gospel to every creature. And that's how the Lord wants His people perpetuated. And then what Romans 10 says, how shall they call on Him in whom they haven't believed? Why would He have anything to believe? You've got to have something to read about Him. And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So the Word of God is a communicated Word, it's a preached Word, it's a beautiful Word. We have it in its completeness today. We can rely on it. And it's the same Bible, it's the same wording, the same type of teaching that was done in the first century. They weren't English speaking people, obviously. Nor are we, like you're saying, Coptic or Syriac <laughs> or Aramaic or Greek. And little Greek's a dangerous thing. So, <laughs> so. Absolutely. But we can go back and run a line, which is beautiful, if, even in the English. If we wonder what that word meant in any version, if we want to see where it is, if we want to know whether a version's out of line or something, some of them are. 
we just take that word, go back and run a study on it. We go right back to the original language of the of the Greek and the Corne Greek and the and the Hebrew, and we can see what the intent and what the message was. So again, provable. Right. Prove all things. Right. Hold, the, hold fast to what's good. So uh, we're going to stop and kind of uh, wind down here this evening. And uh, we want to thank Bob for coming. Thank you. Oh, it's been a joy. Very much. I, and, uh, I always enjoy that. You know, some of the times people say, well, I hate to bother you with the question. I love talking about the Bible. Yes, yes. And we'll, we'll uh, set something up with Roy. And uh, if you'd like to go with us, and we'll talk to Roy. Yeah. And, and again, uh, Bob's, Bob's not one of those guys that's going to say something and then run hide from you, okay? <laughs> he'll, he'll, he's ready to answer for what he said, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm in agreement with what he was saying. And so we'll, we'll be glad to come out and talk with, with Roy because we all want to come to a knowledge of truth. It's our desire is not to win an argument, but to find out what the Bible teaches. And so we'll be, we'll be following up on that okay. and uh, let you know about that. But if you're in the, in, in the Charlotte area, and, uh, or in the Tryon Street area there of Charlotte, uh, go hear Bob. He's a good, good gospel preacher, and he loves the Lord. And he and his wife, we're blessed to have them in this area. And we, we're just so glad you're here. Okay. And uh, you're welcome here as far as, as far as I can tell just about any time you want to come. Well, so <laughs> so anyway, but uh, we thank you again for, for coming and, and helping us tonight. And I, I, I really like having two people, somebody to bounce things off of uh, in, in things like this. Um, we want to invite you to, to come back to the program in, on January the 21st. And we'll be uh, coming to you again live here. And we hope that you will be here every first and third Tuesday from 8 to 10 as we discuss more things from God's Word. And particularly, we're going to be talking about translations of the Bible on the next program. So tune in, some of the same questions we had tonight. Thank you for your time tonight. You've been very gracious. Thank you again.